So we're going to continue on with graphing sine and cosine functions, but today we're going to talk about um, graphing with phase shifts. So they're going to be shifted to the right and to the left, and we're also going to talk about sinusoidal regression on the calculator. Very boldly highlighted worksheet 12a, where we're going to start today. So this is a warm-up question. Um, you guys did a really nice job of coming up with the um, basic sine and cosine graph on your unit circles, but, you know, just to warm up, go ahead and do this. So the amplitude is what size? And this is, it's one of them. Which one is it? The amplitude is two. It's the absolute value of the number in front, very closely associated with what you used to call a vertical stretch. The B value is inside of the sine and cosine function in front of the variable. So in this case, it's a three. And what that does is it changes the period length if it's not a one. So the period is normally a two pi, but you would divide it by the B value. So in our case, that would be a two pi over three. And then there is a vertical shift. What would you call that? Down one, yes. I like to put the directional words um, because it is also the midline. If they said, where's your midline? You would say Y equals negative one. So speaking of midline, let's get some written down. Uh, I'm going to pretend that this is negative 1. I'll label it in a minute. Now your amplitude is 2. So up to, yeah, close enough. And down to, that is not even close. Try again. I'm just going to move my line. And the labels are the important part, right? So this is at negative 2. This is up here. Oh, that's at 1. Dang. That's at negative 1. This is at positive one, and this is at negative three. I did it right this time. Okay. Are we good then? So this warm-up question is like what we did a few days ago where everything starts at zero. So when I go to count on my radian axes or my x-axes, um, it's counting by quarter points, which we haven't actually found. So the quarter point would be when you take the period and you divide it by four for sine and cosine. So 2 pi over 3, if you divide it by 4, that's the same thing as multiplying by 1 fourth. Of course, I'd want you to simplify that. Um, that would be a pi over 6. This is what you're counting by. So every mark I make, it's counting by a 1 pi over 6. So like 0, obviously, is our starting point when there's no phase shift. And then we have a 1 pi over 6. The next one would be 2 pi over 6, which you could write down, but what's a reduced version of 2 pi over 6? Pi over 3. Very good. And then it's 3 pi over 6, better known as pi over 2. And then it's 4 pi over 6, better known as, I feel like I forgot something, 1 pi over 6, 2 pi over 6, 3 pi over 6, 4 pi over 6, 2 pi over 3. Oh yeah, I can count. That's 4. <laughs> hey, like I said, today's going to be a day, man. Um, now I have to remember what I'm trying to graph. I'm graphing a sine function, which starts at the midline. So at zero radians, we got one of these. Pi over 6 goes up to the top. Pi over 3 back to the middle. Pi over 2 and 2 pi over 3. And then I ruin it by actually graphing it. Hey, it wasn't horrible. What'd I do now, Daniel? Oh, okay, yeah. I don't know how my day is going. What, what, what's your question? You just marked your max and min and use the axes. As long as you label, you're okay. It has to be labeled. Yes, as long as you've labeled it that way, it's fine. I can't argue with you. Okay? Um... I would, on the test, ask you to write your five ordered pairs out. So you'd write like 0, negative 1, pi over 6, 1, and so on and so on. Uh, the domain of this function, remember, this is just one cycle of it. It goes forever. So the domain is from negative infinity to infinity. But the range definitely toggles between a height of, so negative 3 to 1. It has to go low to high, right? So that's a little warm-up for you. Those are nice. We liked those. You all did your worksheet 11 for homework, so you're really good at graphing sine and cosine functions without phase shift. Everyone just said yes. Everyone heard it, right? Okay, so now let's talk about what happens when we do have a phase shift. Well, it's bad news because sometimes it's written in this form or in this form, sine or cosine, 
but you notice the phase shift and everything's kind of muddled together. So what we're going to need to do is rewrite everything in what we call factored form. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. There's a whole lot of formulas here on your notes. Are they on your notes? Cool. You can go back and reference these if you want, but they're basically just rearrangements of things. We're going to see on another worksheet that frequency and period are just reciprocals of each other, which makes sense when we get to modeling. Period is how much time it takes for one cycle to complete, and frequency is how many cycles happen per second or whatever time unit you're doing. So there are reciprocals of each other. So with that in mind, the way you find the B, because we're going to be writing equations over the next couple of days, depends on whether you have period or frequency or whatnot. I might write down a little note to self here. If you need to calculate the B value for like this question here, what you do is if you cross multiply and solve this proportion, that would be two pi divided by the period. There's going to be some questions coming up where I say like, you have a graph whose period is four pi, and then you have to come back and write the equation for me. Okay, that's what we're working towards to, uh, yeah, tomorrow. Uh, should I just tell first hour to just rewatch the lesson and today? First hour, if you're watching, I screwed up. I should not have taught you worksheet 10. That was the wrong worksheet. My bad. All right, so example one. This would have been a perfect place to start. Poor first hour. We started, like I told you guys, I threw him right in the deep end. Give him like the worst question I could possibly give him. All right, uh, this equation is in what we call factored form. So it's already factored. So notice how the pi value is taken outside of a x minus a value. That's what it looks like when it's in factored form. You can clearly see that the b value is pi. I'm going to go ahead and fill that in. The amplitude is the number in front of your function, the absolute value of it, so a 3. Now the period is something you're going to need to calculate for me. You can't see that in the equation. you got to calculate it. Period is 2 pi divided by b. So 2 pi divided by pi, better known as 2. So this is interesting. This is more like a real life question where like it takes two seconds for something to finish. Like that makes sense in a real life application. So you'll see this a lot when we'll be modeling next week. The phase shift should be semi-obvious to you. X minus one half. Just use your gut instinct. What do you think that means for phase shifting? By the way, phase shifting is right and left. A right, good. So I'm gonna say right one half. If you put plus one half, I'm going to assume you mean right. The problem with sinusoidal functions is they're cyclical. So like one kid could look at a graph and think it shifted to the right pi over four. And another kid could come through and say, no, I think it's something else that's been shifted to the left three pi over four. And you're both right. So we have to be careful about that, whether we're interpreting the function starting point from a certain point. And the vertical shift, normally there'd be like a plus something over here, but in this case there's nothing. So your midline, your vertical shift is still going to be at zero. And it might help you to write down the shape. Cosine is this guy, right? Starts at the top, maximum line. Okay, so here's where the work comes in. It doesn't ask you for this. This is just a thing. I like to find the quarter point. So the quarter point, remember, is where you take the period and you quarter it. So you all found the period to be two. If you were to quarter that, that's one half. This is what you're going to count by. Okay, so this time I get to use zero as my midline. I have a maximum and minimum line at three and at negative three. Don't get crazy. The bigger they look on your graph, the harder they are to graph. And here's where it gets tricky. I'm no longer going to be starting at zero because of the phase shift. So the first time that I make a point, it's going to be at right one half. So what I'm going to do on my axes is I'm going to call this a one half. Now when I go to make my next one, two, three, four points, I'm supposed to count by what? What was my quarter point? Half. We can do this. Ten-year-olds can do this. So can we. Ready? One half plus one half is one. Yeah, you can call it two halves if you want to. One. Okay, remember, you're at two halves. Two halves plus one halves is good. Plus another one half? Just two. Plus another one half? There you go. 
I'm okay with it. Are you okay with it? Oh, am I okay with non-reduced ones? So if you, is that what you asked? Oh, no, please don't do mixed numbers because that gets really confusing with radians later. So get in the habit of doing improper fractions. So if you wrote down two halves and four halves over here, you would just come back through and you'd be like, eh, never mind, that's a one, that's a two. So if you have difficult, if fourth and fifth grade give you nightmares still, put down the non-reduced fractions and then come back through and fix them. All right, we're almost there, guys. I just remember the shape. This was cosine. It wasn't reflected, so it started at the maximum. So your cosine graph at one half, the first point, you can start way up here. Comes back to the midline, down to the bottom, back to the midline, back to the max. Yes, Daniel. Yeah. Right. Well, it wouldn't. It, okay, that's a great question. If we came back to the origin and we started here, uh huh, which is where the interpretation comes into play, right? So when we go to write equations tomorrow, I'm going to give you a graph, and if this was our graph, you might think it's a sine function that's not shifted, and then like Adam would be like, nope, it's a cosine function who's been shifted right. It's all about interpretation, and you're both correct. They are the same thing. Cosine is sine, right? I'm with you. You're preaching to the choir, man. Doesn't. And when we do regression today, you're going to notice your calculator is programmed to turn everything to a sine function because the calculator program says, why should I have to have two regressions? Just call them all signs. Yeah, so you're going to see that on the calculator today. Um, domain does go forever, even though we've only graphed one. And your range stretches from negative three to three. Very good. Now, on your test, I will ask you to label your one, two, three, four, five ordered pairs. Um, since I don't really know how tight on time I am today, because this is apparently the first time I'm teaching the lesson properly, I'm just going to move on and not write those five ordered pairs. Y'all will have to do that on the test and probably your homework. All right, the next one is, our, it doesn't have to be factored, because when I look inside of the sine function, there is no value in front of the x as a coefficient other than the 1. So that tells me my b value is a 1. It's like an invisible 1 right here. You don't have to factor out a 1. So what that means for the period length, it's just going to stay the normal 2 pi. The amplitude, this is a bit of a trick question, the absolute value of negative 2, which is a 2. What does the negative do, though? going to be reflected. So I might want to make a note to myself. I'm going to forget. The phase shift should be what you think it is. If you look inside of the sine function, I see x minus pi over 4. So that means right pi over 4. Vertical shift this time, you do have one. There's enough one. This shape now be a good time to remind myself that the sine function normally goes like this, but this one's reflected, so it does this. I'm still going to forget. It's okay. <laughs> midline. Remember, everything got shifted up once. Your midline no longer at zero. Your midline is now at y equals one. So the vertical shift and midline are essentially the same question. I just would like you guys to write the midline as an equation. First step. Yes, Daniel. Only graph one cycle? Oh. Well, that's a great question. When we move on to inverse trig functions, we're going to restrict the domain because we'll find out later that if you don't restrict the domain, you can't find an inverse trig function. And then in real life application questions, the domain isn't forever. Because, like, if I'm on a Ferris wheel and I want to know what happens when I'm on the Ferris wheel, do I care what happened negative 10 seconds before I got on the Ferris wheel? I don't. To be frank, I don't really care about when I'm on the Ferris wheel either. Do I care about when I get off of the Ferris wheel and what happens to the Ferris wheel? Probably not. So my domain in that case would be restricted to the real life time that I'm in the problem. That's a great question. though. But yes, domain does go forever, technically. All right, um, right, let's graph. Oh, you know what I didn't find? No, quarter point. Uh, I'm going to jot this down right here. So the quarter point would be when you take your period and you divide it by 4. Now, I know normally I would reduce that to pi over 2. 
However, what I'm going to notice here is that my phase shift and my quarter point are going to have some math with them. Like I'm going to start at right pi over 4, and then I'm going to keep adding pi over 2 to it. So think like a fifth grader. Would you rather add a fourth to a fourth or a fourth to a half? You'd rather add fourth to fourth because you have to add with common denominators. Now, I'll talk about your backup plan in case you aren't a fan of fifth grade in a minute. Um, but yes, obviously that's zero. The first time I actually make a point, though, is going to be at pi over four. And then if I count by, yes, I know it's pi over two, but fifth graders say common denominators. One pi over four plus two pi over four is three pi over four. Now add another two pi over four. 5 pi over 4. Add another 2 pi over 4. And I think I need one more. <laughs> there we go. So there's my 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 points, because remember, we don't start at 0 anymore. And it worked out nicely because I could interpret them with common denominators. Now, if you're like, nope, hated it in fifth grade, still hate it now, what you're going to do is if you know you had to take pi over 4 and you had to add 1 half pi to it, on your calculator, you would just type the coefficients. You would type 1 fourth plus 1 half, and you'd math enter enter that baby, and you'd get a 3 fourths. But then notice I didn't type pi on purpose. You would have to know that the next point is not 3 fourths, but it's 3 pi over 4. So when you go to add the coefficients on your calculator, if that's what you're doing, just don't add the pi into the problem. Flap the pi on the end of each one of your marks. I think you guys can add fractions, though. I've seen. I can do it. You can do it. All right. Um, let's talk about the line. I didn't draw any lines yet. All right. So your midline is at 1. Label it however you want, but I'm just going to go ahead and say that's 1. Amplitude is 2. So I'm going to pretend that this is 2. Or no, that's not 2, but it's 2 up. And then this would be 2 down, but I kind of missed, but that's okay. So this is 1. This would be a 3. And this would be a negative 1. Did I do that right? Amplitude of 2 in each direction. And I'm graphing a sine function, which does start on the midline. But remember, your sine function was shifted to the right pi over 4. So this is the first ordered pair that I'm going to plot. And then normally sine for the next mark would go up to the top. But wait, what do I have to remember? This one's been reflected, so down to the bottom. And then back to the midline. <laughs> now back up to the top and back to the midline. See? It's so easy to screw up. These are so annoying. And then I screw it up anyways because I can't graph. Oh my goodness. All right, so now I kind of step back and I think about all the things you told me a minute ago. You told me it was shifted right pi over four, a sine function, reflected. Does that all work out? Kind of. <laughs> and I know it's kind of hard to see the period length. You could do a quick calculation though. Nine pi over four minus one pi over four. The distance from there is eight pi over four, better known as two pi. So y'all did a great job. What is the range? Negative 1 to 3. There we go. And again, you're supposed to come back through and label the five ordered pairs. I just feel so bad for first hour. I, oh, I gave them those awful problems. I quit. Okay. Um, 12. I don't know. Are we on 12B now? Does it. So finally, um, half hour says call the typo. Okay. So slide a parenthesis in there. And if we do that, which is not normally what we do, we don't just put parentheses places, that was just a typo, okay? This is still in factored form. So you should be able to pull out like all the pertinent pieces. The amplitude this time is a one. The B value is a two, which means my period has changed to a I. Very good. So phase shift. I see a right pi over four. Thanks, typo. A vertical shift of up three. Got a nice little cosine graph coming your way. And the midline, because we're shifted up three, the midline's gonna be at y equals three. All right, let's get some lines down. That's what I wanted. What did I say, three? Oh man. So I was 
the reason, Daniel, to address your issue from earlier, the reason I don't use the axes if I don't have to, I like to put my marks there because my graph is so ugly to begin with that if I put marks on my axes and I don't have another axes to work with, I got problems. Well, that's, that's a me thing, though. Maybe you're better than me. Bet you're a good grapher. Maybe you could prove it to me on your homework this time. Okay. So, it's like you never know what you're going to get on a Daniel test. It could be amazing or it could be garbage. All right, quarter point. Guys, we're going to take the period and we're going to quarter it. Hey, this kind of works out beautifully, though, because look, your phase shift and your quarter point, hello, fifth grade, you already have common denominators. So this is going to work out beautiful. All right, so first point that I'm going to mark, not zero because it's phase shifted, we're going to have a marking at pi over four. So now you're going to keep adding pi over fours uh, because that's the quarter point as well. So one pi over four plus one pi over four is, yeah, and you're welcome to write down two pi over four. We'll come back to that. And then you got a three pi over four. And you got a four pi over four. One more. You got a five pi over four. So now you can come back through and change all the ones that need to be changed. So like two pi over four, better known as pi over two. And then four pi over four, better known as pi. If you can do those changes as you go, that's awesome. Uh, hmm. Some days we're not awesome. Ah, what is this, cosine? <laughs> All right, cosine starts at the maximum. We're not reflected this time, are we? So at pi over four, the new starting point, whoop, all the way up here. And then back to the middle, towards the bottom, back to the middle, up to the top. I did not space that out very well. Now, <laughs> really big dot, that works. Uh, you're supposed to label all five of those ordered pairs for the sake of time. Y'all okay if I skip that part, but you know, same as you always did. So pi over four, comma four. On the test next week, we put like five ordered pair skeletons off to the side. So you can just list out your ordered pairs over there. You don't have to make your graph all icky. All right. This one, finally, we get to experience what it looks like when it's not in factored form. All right, this gets a little crazy, guys. First of all, do you notice how it's not in factored form? Because there's a B value other than one, plus there's a phase shift, and it doesn't have that additional set of parentheses. So what I need you to do we're going to rewrite this. Three can stay where it's at. The sine can stay where it's at. But inside of the sine function, you're going to take the B value of one half out of the, the phase shift. So open another set of parentheses within the parentheses. If you took a one half out of this factor, that's like dividing by one half. So the X will remain as an X this time. Plus, now be careful here, guys. You had a pi but you, careful, you divided by one half, right? And if you divide by one half, that's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So you really have a plus two pi right there. That's tricky. And the only way like I convince myself that I haven't screwed it up is I kind of quickly redistribute the one half and I'm like, yeah, totally. That's That would be pi if I put one half times two pi. Okay, so uh, factoring out a fraction is a little tricky. Be careful about that. Minus one hasn't changed though. So your B value, clearly now I can see that's a one half. Um, the amplitude is a three. The period length is going to change. Remember it's two pi divided by the B value. So for y'all, two pi divided by one half, think about fraction work guys, two pi divided by half would be a four pi, which makes for very nice quarter points in a minute. Um, phase shift. You got one. What is it? Left two pi. That's irritating. Not very excited about that. Kind of wish they didn't graph my axes now. I would have moved them over a little further, but whatever. Vertical shift of down one this time. Shape is sine. Whatever. Get back to that. And then the midline, because it was shifted down one, is at y equals negative one. So, come back line, down one, pretend that's negative one, your amplitude is three, so I'm kind of estimating, but whatever. Good news is I can move my lines around when I realize they're not even close to right. 
sure. Okay. Now, let's talk about this for a minute. Quarter point. We haven't actually calculated that part yet. Pi, yeah. 4 pi divided by in quarters would be pi. Here's good news. You're shifting left 2 pi. You're supposed to count by 1 pi. They're not even fractions. They're integers. Okay, cool. Uh, bad news. You're supposed to start at left 2 pi. So since I'm going to be counting by 1 pi, that's what I'm going to use as like tick marks, if you will, along the axes. Um, so I'm going to call this negative pi. And I'm going to kind of extend these, this, and I'm going to call this guy negative 2 pi. So negative 2 pi, negative 1 pi, this is obviously 0. And then we're going to have a pi and a 2 pi. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 things. That's all I need. Okie dokie, here we go. We're graphing a sine. So starting at left 2 pi on the midline, there's your first sine point. And then counting by 1 pi, next thing you'd be at is negative pi. So you'd be up here at the top. Now don't, everyone skips 0. It drives me crazy. 0 is a number 2, guys. So 0 is your next point. Now on your homework, if it's a worksheet, oh man, ugly. Oh, geez, okay. If it's a worksheet generated by a computer program, um, it'll already have the axes and everything kind of done for you. So at the very least, you should see some really cool symmetry. And if you forget a point, you're going to be like, that's not right. Um, even I can tell when I've forgotten a point. Unfortunately, here I, I didn't space my tick marks out properly. So mine looks really bad. Um, but I would expect you guys to come back through and label all five of these ordered pairs if we were on a test or homework. And uh, I'm going to run out of time today, so we're going to skip ahead to regression. Oh, like literally the next question. There we go. Okay, so on your calculator, we've done a lot of regressions in our past, and today is just a new one. It's sinusoidal regression, and a lot of things in nature, but in life in general, do have a sinusoidal shape. They are repetitive. We keep using the stupid Ferris wheel question, but that's a great example of something that's cyclical and repetitive. Um, the temperatures are cyclical and repetitive in theory, unless climate change ruins everything for you. Like now. I wonder what this problem would look like now. Not, not this. <laughs> okay, so this is, anyways, it's not even our city. It's Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, it's the average monthly temperature from all the months. Now, be careful, because sometimes on their homework, they do weird things. Like, they did say right here, let X equals 1 represent January. But I remember, like, I think it was in last semester, there was a question where they had a calendar problem. And they're like, let January be 0. And that went against everything my first grade teacher ever taught me, because that means February had to be one. And I was like, but no, February's two. Like, <laughs> it bothered me. So just be careful that in the problem, if it's a calendar problem, they're going to very clearly state, like, January, call it this. And the other thing you got to watch out for, sometimes they don't give you all the months. So it'll go, like, January, March. And they would skip every so many. It's very irritating. So just be careful. In this case, they were very nice to you. January, they're going to call it 1, and it does go through all 12 months. Okay, so this is the raw data they collected. I need you guys to enter this into your data in your calculator. So in list 1, please um, type 1, 2, 3, 4, so on, so on, all the way down to 12. And then in list 2, could you please type these average monthly temperatures? I'm going to pause the video, and I think I have it all typed in right, but... Who knows? Because when I went to go do this first hour, guess what happened? They all got different answers than me. So I'm going to go double check my data. So in our list, we have data, list one, list two. So months, one to 12. And then list two is all those temperatures. Hopefully nothing's mistyped for Mrs. Abruzzo. Um, then we're going to do what's called sinusoidal regression. So stat, go over to calc. And then if you go towards the bottom of the list, there's synreg, sinusoidal regression. Notice there's no cosinusoidal because we've talked about this earlier, how they're all kind of the same thing. So they always reference them in terms of a sine graph. So on the newer calculators, you get a prompting screen. Um, my iterations was defaulting to a three. This is where I feel like we might get different answers right here. So if you have this prompt, go ahead and put a three. But if you have an older calculator that doesn't prompt you at all, just don't put anything. Just list one and list two. Now, leave period blank. 
but I do want you guys to store your equation. So let's use that shortcut, that alpha trace thing. If you don't have the shortcut on your calculator, the way you pull up y1 is you go to varies, go over to y varies, choose function. And then the first one there was y1. Dang. Okay. <laughs> so anyways, uh, that's what I got when I put it as four iteration and left period blank and all that good stuff. Now, did I store it? I don't know. Let's find out. Okay. Apparently I stored it. So the follow-up question there, it talks about, um, Oh, it's a totally different question. First hour, ah, I was panicking because I was like, it doesn't match the key. So I had just made up a question apparently, and I was like, according to your model, so not the raw data, but according to your model, what should be the average monthly temperature in October? So for that, I would go to my table, and this is where first hour and I, we we're getting kind of different answers. For 10, I got that number, but kids were telling me they didn't get that number. You got that number, but Adam didn't. Didn't get that. What do you have? Like 57 something? Okay. Have you figured out what's wrong, Piper? Oh, is it a table? Your table's in ask mode, which you can just type a 10. Okay. So, okay. You got 57. Did you do four iterations? You did three. What'd you do, Adam? Three. Okay. So, welcome to the world of. I guess it matters, right? Um, I'm going to do some more investigation to determine what we as a class want to come up with because it does change the output outcome, right? I'll figure it out and I'll let you know. The good news is for your homework tonight, you don't really need to practice this yet. We'll do more of these tomorrow. What I want y'all to do for homework is just practice graphing with phase shifting. So your assignment, you evil worksheet 10. Okay. <laughs> this is your new assignment, guys. It's on the back of, uh, or the front of worksheet 12.5. It's bookwork. Um, if you decide you want a page of graphing to do it, because obviously my graphs lack a little bit of artistic prettiness, I usually do mine on another sheet of paper. Um, but there's a photocopy of the bookwork there, so you don't have to look it up. It's just those few questions. They should have phase shifts. And when we get more sinusoidal regression under our belt tomorrow, then you can worry about practicing that. I'll get back to you on the iteration question because the fact that it defaulted to three makes me think we're supposed to use three. But now I'm nervous. So I'll get back to you to be determined. And again, apologies to first hour. I'm so sorry, first hour. Yeah, look at the questions I made first hour do today. Wait, just wait. That one, right? That was the first one we did. Like, hello, welcome to something kind of new. Let's do the worst possible question I could give you. Oh, here, let's do another horrible question. And how about another one? That one actually wasn't too bad in comparison, right? And then I threw applications at him for no reason. Oh, first hour, I'm so sorry. Right? Throw him right into the deep end. You're a swimmer, you know. All right, I'm out of here. Bye. <laughs>